What does low-income home ownership imply in the Global South? What are the consequences of housing policies that encourage home ownership? I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Management in the Built Environment. During this lesson, we will explore the case of Chile, and you will learn about social housing policies based on ownership. Before I dive into the content, it is important to mention two main points about low-income home ownership and Latin American so social housing policies. In context of vulnerability, the house and the land represent the main economic and social resource to cope with po poverty. They are productive uh, assets that can generate new income. In Latin America, owning a house is, is one of the most important milestones in people's life. The dream of the own house is strongly ingrained in society and it has been encouraged by housing policies for many decades. These have focused on tackling slums, building a large number of dwellings and relocating inhabitants to new houses in the outskirts of the cities. This approach is based on the neoliberal ideology, which seeks to provide access to credits and subsidies for low-income populations to become homeowners. This approach also re relies on the participation of private developers as key players in housing con construction. Now, le let's focus on Chile to understand the effects of social housing policies based of, on ownership and learn from this experience. During the 80s and, and 90s, pro programs for new housing construction succeed in re reducing the, the deficit, providing a new house for people that either live in slums or share a house with relatives. But several authors point out that this housing policy has failed in providing quality solutions. One of the main explanations for this is the mi mismatch between, on the one side, the type of demand, and on the other side, the, the characteristic of the housing stock in terms of location, neighborhood, and type of dwelling. In Santiago, the, the capital, people were re relocated far away from the city center, job opportunities, and social networks. The massive construction in the outskirts in Santiago ge generate large and homogeneous areas with low-income homeowners, failing to provide manageable na neighborhood and livable urban spaces. The dwellings were de designed for st standard and nuclear families, Pay no at attention to the widespread allegamiento, which is the Spanish term to describe when more than one nuclear family share a house. One of the main consequences of this is the con construction of informal home enlargement to give space to incoming relatives. After years of occupancy, this neighborhood has faced rapid deterioration and impoverishment. Without proper housing policies and support, low-income homeownership may generate conditions that perpetuate poverty. One of these situations is when homeowners can afford the daily costs associated to owning a house. Another example is when poor location triggers exclusion and spatial segregation. So, what lessons can be drawn from this experience? We will discuss three main points. The first point is to design housing policies according to local needs and cultural background. When we talk about home ownership, the main actors are the household members. The dwelling will change and adapt according to their economic and social needs. For example, tertiary an extended family or adapting the dwelling to economic activity. Hence, policy makers, urban planners and architects need to be able to identify their clients and their specific needs and to translate them into policies and projects. What are the household dynamics and how do they affect the physical condition of dwelling, buildings and neighborhood? Can you identify the local needs and cultural behavior in your own context? Are they considered in current housing policies in your country? Second, to think about maintenance, because a new process starts when the house is built. The Chilean experience shows us that ensuring access to housing for low-income groups is not a su success indi indicator in itself. 
only have new duties regarding the maintenance and management of, the, of the, the dwelling and building, especially where they live in collective housing. Institutional support to low-income owners will contribute to avoid deterioration, to increase the economic value of dwelling, and to keep the community satisfied with their built environment. What type of support do ho homeowners need? How do the management and maintenance of common areas are organized in your country? And last but not least, to include new social actors in the game. In Chile, a small but increasing number of third sector organizations have become implemented on housing policies. They are organizations that are driven by social goals and that are not neither gov governmental nor private or commercial. Chilean social enterprises active in this field have shown interesting forms of social innovation using participatory methods and innovative tools to support homeowners in the management of their buildings. These organizations are intermediaries because they play a crucial role supporting communities in gaining access to resources, opportunities, and increasing their capacities. A different type of social actors are community leaders. Their skill, experience, and knowledge represent an opportunity that enhance bottom-up approaches. Could community leaders have more active and professional role in housing provision and management? How can new actors like third sector and community-led organizations be part of bottom-up model of housing management? Can you think about new actors leading alternative models in your country? The Tilan case reveals that both the quality of the housing stock and the inclusion of community participation should be considered in the design of housing policy at local level. It also, it also shows the need of thinking beyond housing pro provision, extending to management and maintenance activities, and, and foreseen opportunities based on the participation of new actors. The de development of alternative provision and management model for the Global South not only depends on having a comprehensive understanding of each context, but also on, on using the existing social capital in innovative ways.